This is uh, Jim Fetzer continuing my conversation with Dr. Catherine o uh, uh, Horton and with Oli Domagard about a whole host of issues today. Oli, I thought that was a magnificent uh, overview, absolutely perfect, passionate, articulate, spot on, spot on. Ka Catherine, I know you want to say a few words about Oli's disquisition here, but I thought he was just masterful. Yes, I want him to continue. I want him to continue. I just want to interject uh, just very short sentences. Um, number one, Europe is interesting uh, also for the Americans to look at because we have little experimental pools. Um, we can't go from one country to the next like uh, people in the, in the US can go from one state to the other because there are language boundaries. So, you know, if you live somewhere in Europe, you can drive two hours in one direction and suddenly the food is different, the language is different and people are different and you just, you know, you, you suddenly have difficulties even renting a flat. So through that, we have been put into little uh, paddocks, like little ponies in separate paddocks and like cows, you know, and uh, we can all run our own experiments. And it's very interesting to me, first of all, because I love Scandinavia. I love most of Europe, but Scandinavia was beautiful because the people are so nice. And especially we spend a lot of time in Sweden and the people are extremely welcoming. I knew that they have recovered from very hard financial times. And in, uh, you know, through parts of the 20th century, the Swedish were extremely poor. They had extreme poverty. So through their solidarity, they climbed out of it, and we experienced Sweden as extremely social. And I can see that this is precisely what these globalists are exploiting. I can also see that in every country, the way the globalists have, and this organized crime cartel have wormed, wormed themselves to the top, it's always exploiting the, the special characteristics of the country, you know? And I think with this, the Swedes, it was their, their welcomingness, their solidarity, and that's going, they, you know, the globalists take some good characteristics, then overstretch them and use them to kill you, I think, pretty much, you know. I have to say, I also found it really funny to hear a Danish person say to the Swedes that they have no spine. <laughs> no, but I do <laughs> Yeah, yeah, but no, it's, no. It's, it's not funny at all. And, and no, I don't, I know, but I don't want to be rude, but I, I really, it's like an, a nation that needs a kick in the butt because they are being, it's awful what's going on in Sweden now. It's, I'm, I'm so uh, suffering in my heart when I see what's happening to this beautiful nation. And the, I, the book I wrote about the, uh, the assassination of the Swedish Prime Minister, Ola Palme, the title is coup d'etat in slow motion because that is what happened. There wasn't an overtake, a power overtake, not democratic, not through a brutal slaughter, if it happened, uh, that went in slow motion so that nobody would really understand what happened. That's boom, and then slowly, 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 and now the nation, like, I, I go there, I'm, I'm like, what is going on? And uh, so I was born in Denmark, grew up in Sweden, but in, in Denmark, I, I recently received, uh, there's this uh, woman who said that uh, she, she wrote this poem, beautiful poem, about how she lost her nation the last 10 years. The, the country that was there is no longer. And uh, this, this is what we see again and again. And, and so I think it's, if you are a leader of a nation and you care about your people, you care about your country, then there would be a certain logic to your actions. I think that is, that is fair to say. So I ask you, if a leader of the country, for no apparent reason, opens up the borders, if they do, uh, for no apparent reason, that they do a lot more for immigrants than for the elderly, than for the schools, than for the daycare center, than for hospitals, and so on. I ask you, why is that done? Is it because they don't get it, or they, don't, they care more about immigrants than their own uh, uh, inhabitants, or is it there to get the, the emotions going? If you let people in with other religions, I mean, I, I'm a foreigner in, in a foreign country as, as well. I mean, I'm, I'm welcomed here in another country, so I'm very grateful to be here. And I try to uh, treat everything around me with respect. So 
when when and freedom i mean for everyone as long as you follow the heart and don't hurt anyone else go for it that's what i say but when you see when uh people of uh muslim faith come to a country like sweden okay then uh and you feel that the more you let in there's more and more tension building up then if you are the leader of the country i would say and you care about peace and and uh, the welfare of your nation you would say let's see if we can calm this down and see if we can build bridges make people understand each other better get be on better then there's room enough for us you know no so what is what ex uh, is instead what is happening is that for instance in i think it's in Växjö, a city in the south of sweden they the local church were not allowed to use the church bell on sundays this is as far as i know that is correct because it was annoying people thought it's annoying it's too loud instead they let the muslim community build a mosque and now they just allowed for these uh, prayer uh, oh, 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 oh. like so what are we looking at are we looking at some some leaders because i'm not blaming the immigrants at all at all i'm saying who is the one deciding this who are the ones making these rules who are the ones making the decisions that opens up for this another illustration only here in the united states christian churches are taking down the crosses because they're offensive to muslims i mean what kind of dedication is that to your own faith and of course but, angela merkel in germany said that we need to give up national sovereignty, get rid of borders, and and uh, for the sake of the new world order, and disregard the preferences of our own citizens. She said, disregard the preferences and desires of our own citizens for the sake of this greater good, which is really globalism in its most extreme form. I cannot believe the, the treason, the betrayal of the German people, of, of their chancellor, just outrageous. But yeah. this is what we see. This is what we see in nation by nation by nation. And so how is that possible? The same agenda in different nations, how is that possible? It's called the New World Order. It's called Agenda 21, Agenda 30. It's through the Bilderberg Group. I mean, look at these individuals. Is Angela Merkel, does she uh, come forward as a very loving, caring person? I think not. Uh, it's like, what is going on? It's for us to wake up and see, my God, let's stop the madness. The, these individuals are not to be trusted. They are traitors. They are traitors and super criminals. So what is going on in Sweden now? Oh, who's going to be the next, uh, who's going to be the next prime minister? I know it's Annie Lööf. She was, uh, she's a Bilderberger. She's the Trilateral Commission. I've said that for the last three, four years. It's, only, it's not sort of like a big mystery. No, you can't say that. So, so they totally rigged the elections. I mean, on live TV, there was this uh, party. I'm not interested in politics at all because uh, it's like organized crime group. Anyway, so, but anyway, it, on live TV, the numbers for a party that nobody wants to deal with, but all the people I know in Sweden, every single one I spoke for, voted for that one. So it went from, I think it was 27%, and then on live TV, suddenly there was a blackout on the screen during the election, and suddenly it came back at 17. I mean, what? And nobody is reacting. I'm like, wake, beat me up, Scotty. Another There's example something of the, ar arrogance, the arrogance of the deep state. Once again, yeah, Captain, but look I, at you. Ha, look at your nation, Jim. Where where Bush? I mean, they just totally rigged the second election, at least. Of, I mean, and made well, it all digital, so they could play around and do whatever they want now. So whoever well, they two, want. Two thousand was rigged to get Bush and Cheney and to bring us nine eleven. That was a I necessity. Know. They even had uh, Jeb Bush as a governor in Florida, where uh, it yeah. made all the difference. And actually, the 2016 was rigged, but it was rigged for Hillary. It, it was the outlying counties in Pennsylvania, Ohio, Michigan, and Wisconsin that had suffered a lot of casualties from the Middle East wars who voted for Trump, not with any certainty, but in the belief he was the less likely of the two candidates to continue the wars. And only now are we seeing signs of him following through on his promise to the people 
by bringing the troops out of Syria, and even he's talking about Afghanistan, but it's meeting fierce resistance. The Democratic Party only, which has been opposed to war historically for its entire duration, is now opposed to getting us out of the Middle East. I mean, it's just a complete role reversal. And their proposal to allow unrestricted immigration, I mean, they're failing to draw the distinction between legal immigration, which is just fine, and illegal immigration, just as others are ignoring the difference between legal guns and illegal guns. It's not legal guns that are the problem. It's illegal guns. It's not legal immigration that's the problem. It's illegal immigration. And this seems to be the Western Hemisphere analog to the mass migration into Europe, where Muslims are being used to destroy Christianity. Here, here we have this influx from Central America that was all organized and contrived. 2,888 miles, they claim. They were transporting them in huge trucks. I have video of these big flatbed trucks bringing, you know, 150, 200 immigrants on each truck forward. You can't set off on a large march with, like that without food supplies. You're going to starve in the way. What are you going to do for toiletries? Who's going to provide the toilet paper, for example? Who's going to provide the diapers? We had one staged event of a woman, very corpulent, big gut with two children at the border where they claimed it was tear gas going on. It was actually a smoke grenade. But, but she was supposed to be representing these poor people. But, but she doesn't look, you know, she is so overweight. She is so, you know, and the babies, what are you going to do? Where are you going to get the, the number of diapers you would need for 2,888? I mean, they might need 1,000 diapers. Who was carrying the diapers? This whole thing was a complete farce, completely staged and rigged. And George Soros once again had his fingers on the trucks. The trucks only had the Star of David on them. It was that blatant, that arrogant. But, do, but do, do you know, sorry, Kathleen, do you know here in, in Europe, I managed to track there was there was all of these uh, photos from the borders uh, a year ago where everybody was like oh my god they're here in the thousands okay so there was these photo shoots from the French border and there was these photo shoots from the German border there was these photo shoots from the Belgian border so I thought that is really really interesting because they're fast moving here so I managed to identify some of the same people at the three different borders and I tell you we're talking photo ops. We're talking psyops and photo shoots. The same where, people, the same people at three different borders, the same crisis actors only. I, I was in, in uh, the north of Greece many years ago, uh, and I had to stay there for some reason uh, for three days. And at the time, I didn't know, but there was this big rally. Uh, there was uh, Papa Andreo, uh, I think he was the sitting the prime minister, and there was Mitsutaki, the uh, challenger. <clears throat> and so the, it was just before the election. And so I, I was staying in Saloniki. I just had to wait there, and I, so I had nothing to do. So I was just walking around for three days, and I started seeing all of these buses coming with thousands of people coming in from Bulgaria, which is just across the border. And I mean, they, I saw them get off the bus and they were giving these uh, like posters and all of them with Papa Andreo, you know? And I was like, I know the difference between Bulgarian and, and uh, Greek, you know, the, the languages. They didn't even, even understand what's on, what was on the posters. And, and then in the, in the night, I've got photos of it. I'm in the, in the middle of a million people. I've never seen that many people in a town square. I mean, the whole city center, it was packed of mostly, I think, Bulgarians that was there supporting Papa Andreo. No, they were there because they were dead poor on the other side of the border and they were being paid to get on the buses, go there, free lunch, say, whoa, 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 Papa Andreo, and then go back home and get like $10 or whatever. That was a lot of money for them. It is a psyop. It is a psyop. And this is what we're seeing here again. Catherine. Hi. I, one of the, I've got a couple of insider, uh, you know, uh, pieces of information, some eyewitness, some, some things that I just know from the region I'm from. So first of all, I can entirely back up what you said about protesters and so on being imported from other parts. There's a historic precedent of this, and this was the overthrow of, yeah, yeah the, the staged overthrow of the Romanian dictator Ceausescu. There was a big protest, and just because, before he was executed, he was due to hold a big speech, and then during his speech, suddenly the entire crowd started booing and whistling. 
And then, you know, they staged how they all, you know, thought, oh my goodness, the, the crowd's about to get him. They whisked him off into a helicopter and then the next day he was executed. It was very quick. Done by MI6 and the CIA, you know, good job. But one of the things that they did together with the Romanian secret services is import miners from really the arse end and the back of beyond of Romania. These people could barely read and write and they were imported and they came up on the day on trains and they were funneled into the, uh, um, the uh, uh, square and they were told when to start whistling. This is already well known. So this is what Intel agencies have done for a very, very, very long time, you know? So it's nothing new. Now, fast forwarding to the German immigration, which started like mass immigration waves, uh, started in September, I think September, 2015. Now in 2013 to 15, I lived in Munich. And because I was already targeted by the time uh, I moved to Munich, Intel arranged it such that the flat that I would um, get in the end turned out to be, I think, a kilometer and a half from the headquarters of German Intel called Bundesnachrichtendienst. So as I lived in that flat and I was at the time trying to launch a startup and I was just working in the local community, I watched how these gang stalkers are being trained. I watched children, really children. Uh, you know, ages between eight to 12 being trained to be gang stalkers by German Intel. And in one day, so I used to have in that at the time, I used to have the habit of going on a one hour bike ride. And I used to cycle down actually past the BND building and then down into beautiful forest and come back up along the, the shores of the Isar, the river going through. Looking back, I now realize I probably went past a massive underground station, which was the Death Star of Germany, the Bundesnachrichtendienst, but above ground, it's beautiful. And on my cycle ride, I always used to have these gang stalkers. And because I did the same tour, after a year, I figured out where the gang stalking posts would typically be, and I figured out at what density. And one day, when oh, I also before, I could, I could always tell when the BND was training up, they're Chinese infiltrators because suddenly on one day, you know, all my gang stalkers would be mostly Chinese. I used to call it Asia Weeks at the Bundesnachrichtendienst. But anyway, so at some point, and that was in May or maybe April, March, May, so spring, spring 2017, suddenly all my gang stalkers turned black and Middle Eastern. And Munich, so where the Bundesnachrichtendienst is, it's a very Aryan German area okay Aryan Aryan you know most houses have little Latin Latin slogans you know which then turn out to be some military uh, slogan or something so it's that type of people and there were no black people not one not one by mistake typically and suddenly it's the whole area is full of black people so these people were also exactly at the gang stalking posts so I figured out oh Already six months before I even heard about this mass immigration in Germany opening its borders, I knew that something was going to happen that the BND was preparing for, which involved a lot of black people and people of Middle Eastern looks. So in other words, already six months before, German Intel was training up their infiltrators and those people would become handlers, right? So the entire thing is Intel staged. So German Intel prepared these immigration waves. And then when this whole thing started in 2015, I had my family visiting and I took them back to the central train station. And that's exactly where these immigrant waves were arriving. And it was very, very creepy because at some point, as we were standing on the platform waiting for our train, a train load of supposed immigrants arrived and the doors opened and out came, you know, a lot of people and they just kept pouring out. And my entire family just, you know, watched the scene. And then we all looked at each other and we said, these were not immigrants. And my mother said, yes, look at the shoes. So the shoes that they were wearing were these, you know, kind of canvas shoes where you just walk down to the end of the street and they fall apart. So no way do people go anywhere in those. So these people were rounded up somewhere very close by and just, you know, poured out for these scenes. And as soon as they were done, they would bugger off back to their flats, you know? 
So this whole thing is just nonsense. Well, the it's Bard ridiculous. said all the world's a stage. It's become literally political theater internationally. I mean, again and again and again. It's just stunning. No connection to reality. All fabricated. Everything is fake. And as Oli suggests, the true is the false, the good is the evil, it's Orwellian to the extreme. Well, you know, the it other is. thing is also, it is true that there's a, a huge amount of immigration, but it's actually away from these very, you know, these publicized places, because the, the central train station of Munich was filmed, and everything that they, you know, had there was staged. But then in other parts of Germany, people keep reporting that these buses are arriving and they are just new immigrants being offloaded. And these buses come one every hour and they have been coming one every hour for weeks and months and months on end. So how many people do they offload into every region? See, this and is where this is this is nothing to do with cultural diversity. This has to do with population yeah. replacement. They're bringing in a whole exactly. lot of black migrants. <laughs> who don't have the same customs, traditions, don't know the language, have no interest in doing so, who are going to replace the native population. And in fact, they tend to reproduce at a more rapid rate. This is analogous to coming, having a guest stay in your guest room for a weekend versus move into your house and take it over. That's actually what's going on here. And Angela Merkel seems to me to have been a key player in promoting this this. NWO agenda to the to her eternal disgrace and damnation. Well, you know that the, the because you know in the past every single conspiracy theory conspiracy theory turned out to be the truth. So the newest conspiracy theory um, that we have <clears throat> actually parts of it are already I think pretty well you know validated. But um, you know the the first uh, conspiracy theory was of course, and this is something I couldn't explain at school at all. I couldn't explain to myself at school how Hitler, who was an unemployed painter type, uh, came in from Austria with supposedly no connections, and then the entire German aristocracy let him rise to the very top and just say, hey, you know what, lead us. Now, this is anywhere impossible because the German aristocracy was very rich, very powerful, very well connected. And this whole story doesn't make any sense what the hell soever. So the question is, who the hell was Hitler? And one of the stories I heard was that he was the illeg illegitimate child connected to the Rothschilds. And suddenly the story makes total sense because they have an illeg illeg illegitimate son. They can pull him in, they can put him on the world stage and the entire German aristocracy cannot object or else their credit line will be cut by the people who own all the banks, right? And suddenly you can have the sort of leader. So there's that, but now the newest story is that actually Angela Merkel in turn might be related to that bloodline. Well, right? yeah, yeah, I was about to say, I have a good friend with excellent Intel connection who tells me Angela Merkel is actually Hitler's daughter. daughter. Yeah, exactly. So then what we have is, is this kind of these family dynasties. In other words, we have these mafia families who are then running the show. And, if, and you took, if you took her face and shape and sort of sized her down, she has a similar bone structure. She looks very much like Adolf, very, very much. Would you agree, Ole? Yeah, and, and also the, there's, uh, when you look at the so-called elite, uh, there's, there's a lot of sexual things going on in these families with mistresses and out of marriage uh, relationships and accepted on many on a di whole different level than we know the normal people are sort of accustomed to. And so quite a few uh, children are being born outside marriages. And uh, for instance, uh, uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland, who is the former prime minister of Norway, uh, who was also a Bilderberger, who was also way up there, who's also involved in the massacre on Utøya, if I'm correct. Uh, and uh, she's the child of Willy Brandt, uh, a very a top uh, West German polit politician who is also a spy. And it's sort of like when you, the more you get into these areas and you see how they interact and the Swedish prime minister in his home, Ola Palmer's home, Alan Dulles used to come and Hermann Göring. It's like, what? You, it's like this, it, it just ties together. There's this tiny little group, so-called elite. They call themselves the elite. I've got other not so nice names for them. Uh, but it's like, it's a small little, it's a small little group. And it's, when you look at, for instance, in the States, you see photos of 
Hillary and Bill smiling with the Rothschilds, with you got Trump and you got Obama and Michael, uh, all of these people together and all the Bushes and, and you think, oh, how, well, they seem to know each other. And then you go back and you see, well, they seem to know they knew each other like 20 years ago as well. It's sort of like a theater group and you see, okay, now it's your turn. And then you know, you have to stand back. You'll get your chance in another five years. Go eat some ice cream, uh, behave in the meantime. Uh, or we can use you as a bad boy over there maybe. Okay, we do that and we create some chaos over there so we can bring in the good guy here. And then it's, it's a theater and we're, we're suckers for buying it because it's the same thing over and over and over and over again. And we're like, oh, I'm, I, what is going to happen? What is going to happen? The same thing is going to happen if we don't do something about it. Catherine. You know, in 2019, gentlemen, I would propose that now we spend all this time uncovering these things. So now we should talk about what the hell to do about it, you know, yes. so that yes. 2019 will not be the same thing. By the way, this over and over is exactly what the word revolution means. A revolution mm -hmm. is one cycling, you know, and it's this kind of image of the snake eating its own tail. That's the revolution. You know, that's the Illuminati term for taking turns. That's the revolution, you know. So I think there are excellent starter points and excellent examples of what people have decided to do about it. And number one is, for example, this. It, this explains a lot. So this is the um, this is a plot made by the Swiss Propaganda Research Institute here, and they have mapped the entire American media empire. So in this diagram, we recognize the three um, or two uh, of the sorry, yeah. We mentioned two of the, 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 the three steering arms here already because Ola mentioned the Bilderberger meetings and the Trilateral Commission. And these people mapped how many people in media are connected to the Bilderbergers, the Trilateral Commission, or even the Council on Foreign Relations. And suddenly we can see why all of these, the Financial Times, you know, every item of news media here and other, you know, YouTube and corporates, why they are all doing exactly the same you know it's easy when it's the very same people at the top and then when you go to the german media landscape it's exactly the same right just that the council on foundation it's in a proxy which is called the atlantic bridge uh, but it's the very same people you know so i think you know when when all is said we are dealing with pure evil the way I call it is that we are dealing with networked evil. Okay. That's why it's so powerful. These people are networked. And in terms of, of systems analysis, networks are some of the most powerful things, you know, pyramid organizations and networks. So I would say, if you want to counter this, we have to uncover their networks and we need to form our own, yeah. you know, and then the people have to vote. Are they going with, you know, the Masons slash Nazis slash globalists? Or are they going with those people who are recapturing the systems and building new systems? Well, you're talking about uh, literal communication networks, but that represent a, a web of evil. So yes. it's a very powerful combination, Ole. I think uh, what you just show, I love these type of evidence. I mean, when it's so easy to see, it's so easy. You get an overview, instant overview, and you can say, no, no, I don't believe that. And then you can look, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. I love it. This is the type of information that can make a difference. It takes thousands of hours of investigation to find out of these things, but once it's there, there's not a lot of arguing going on. I mean, this is how I try to do with all of these false flags that I really try to go so meticulously into detail so that once it's presented, it's like, that's it. You, you, and I think that is why very, I don't think I've ever been challenged sort of uh, verbally in any interview or anywhere because it's game over because it's not what I'm saying. It is the proof is there just like these... I mean, of course, you have to double check and triple check these type of so-called evidence as well. But in my opinion, I haven't looked into that one, but that is uh, hardcore. Fantastic, fantastic. Well, you know, we have this fan fantastic situation in the United States 
for the communication media, which has been infiltrated by the CIA since the 1950s, is just turned on the present president with unbelievable savagery because he's outing them. He's exposing the fake news media. No one in our history has ever called the media out as has Donald Trump. And really, if he'd done nothing else, he would be a great benefactor to the American people. He's, of course, trying to control immigration. And here you have the Democrats who in the past, every one of their leaders has spoken forcefully and articulately about the importance of controlling illegal immigration, talked about fences and other barriers. I'm talking Nancy Pelosi, I'm talking Hillary Clinton, I'm talking Chuck Schirmer. Uh, uh, I mean, you name it, they've given a speech about it. And what the Donald ought to be doing is running those speeches over and over and over to show the hypocrisy of the Democratic Party, who, as I mentioned before, they're opposing his pulling out of Syria and Afghanistan. I mean, this is insane, but it represents the culmination of the deep state in the extent to which it's completely taken over a once very important independent Democratic Party. It's absolutely shameless. So a lot of us are hoping that the stories we're hearing about unsealed indictments and all that, about draining the swamp, have some substance to them. The, the strongest indication I've seen as so far as an aerial photograph of Guantanamo that shows that the base has been overhauled, refurbished, and expanded. And that would be for some notable purpose. Then we have other more anecdotal stories, like the messages given out to the Bushes and, and, and the Clintons at the funeral service for George Herbert Walker Bush, and rumors that actually he was tried and executed and didn't die a natural death, but that he was a very despicable man who not only oversaw the Bay of Pigs invasion, but was one of the coordinators of the JFK assassination and untold other malfeasance throughout his life. Terrible. I mean, the Reagan shooting really was a message to Ronnie to let George do it. And from the point in time that he was shot, and it appears to have been under the arm while he's being pushed into the vehicle by a Secret Service agent using a fillet, uh, that barely missed Reagan's heart. He got the message and he let George do it. But I mean, this the Clinton and Bush crime families have been horrendous and they corrupted the Democratic Party, which is now defined totally in terms of its opposition to Donald Trump. There is no more substance in the Democratic Party than collective hatred for Donald Trump, who's trying, trying to clean up the mess. I mean, my take. You know, I just want to us. I want us to be super, super careful with these things, because I have to say, until I see the body, until I am actually, I, you know, they live broadcast a, a war crimes tribunal oh, yeah. uh, trial. I will not believe for one second that this it, isn't a Masonic double bluff. That, you it, know? that George Herbert Walker Bush isn't actually alive. It was another fake funeral. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And there's a very well documented case for this because if people go to the um to Wikipedia and look up the Nuremberg trials on Wikipedia, I can I can prove a lot of the things in one fell swoop of what we were talking about. Um I'm I'm sorry, I'm gonna show some images oh, that yeah. might be shocking. You actually think okay, they are real but they're not okay. Close so this, close your eyes. Squish. So this is this is safe, okay. This is safe. It's, it is for family viewing, okay? So don't freak out. So these are the Nuremberg trials, okay? That we were led to believe by the Masonic crime cartel that they were real, but they were not. They were a hoax and a total fraud, very much like most of the um, Second World War. And most honest people were tricked whereby, um, you know, big war criminals got off scot-free and got richer and happier than they ever were before. Now, under executions at the Nuremberg trial, we're told that Hermann Goering shot him, I'm not sure, they didn't shoot himself, I always confuse that. He poisoned himself the night before the execution. Now this is nonsense, okay? If you are in actual proper custody, there's, it's impossible to poison yourself because there's nowhere to get this stuff. So this is nonsense, okay? Now, if we look at the image of Hermann Goering apparently <clears throat> dead, which he's not, so don't freak out guys, you're not you know, going to see the image of a corpse, you're going to see the image of a war criminal who is totally fine and who's about to escape to Latin America. So this is Hermann Goering, okay? 
And if you look carefully, one of the things that you will see immediately as odd is that one eye is open, the other one is closed. Now, if you have a dead person, it's not that hard to, you know, close his eye. But what he's showing is the symbol of the all-seeing eye. So most Hollywood actors who are now in the Masons and the Illuminati will cover up one eye and have these one-eyed images taken off themselves. Now, that is the symbol of the all-seeing eye that you will find on the $1 bill. It's a crime cartel symbol. The second one, in case you think this is pure coincidence, is the fact that one of his hands is stuffed with his sleeve into his shirt. That's the Masonic symbol of the hidden hand. This is what was displayed, for example, by Napoleon, by Karl Marx, and a bunch of other people, and George Washington as well. They were all Masons. So in other words, Hermann Goering here is a Mason. He's alive and well, and he's signaling to his other Masonic buddies, don't you worry, guys, the Masons have won again. We fooled them all, you know. This is just a joke. He's having a private joke, right? He's playing dead and he's about to be ferried out, you know, through the Jesuit networks, you know, off to Latin America. So this was all nonsense. So now I ask you, you know, are we going to believe straight away that George Bush and this other guy who died, you know, I keep forgetting his name, you know, recently, that they are dead? Are they dead or are they on Lolita Island having a happy retirement? Oh, Lolita Island. <laughs> Seriously. No. You know? Do you know, oh, I, oh, I, I interviewed the uh, CAA whistleblower Chip Tatum many times. Yeah. And one of the things is Chip can fly anything. I mean, he, he can fly, he can fly, get off the radar. He can do all kinds of weird stuff in all kinds of uh, uh, planes. He's a fascinating um, guy. I like him, Oli. Yeah, so do I. I, I can see him. A very straight shooter about... You know, yeah. the macabre, yeah. the, all the secret stuff, the covert ops and so forth. He's, I totally he's agree with you. Talk about I, it straight on. But uh, one of the things he said to me was that uh, he flew many times, uh, uh, many times he flew uh, prisoners into uh, prisons in and out penitentiaries, especially the ones in near Springfield, Missouri, where he said the famous doctors were doing things to them preparing them for as patsies or assassins or whatever he did. He, but also he said he flew a lot of people in and out of the U.S., uh, I think many times to Canada, where many of them, he said, he was like, what, are you still alive? I mean, I thought you were dead. He never mentioned names, but I mean, it was like, uh, hello, Elvis, hello, Jim Morrison, hello. I mean, all kinds of individuals he flew in and out that he thought were dead. And this comes, but he, it was not up to him to ask questions. He was there to fly the plane. And had he started asking questions. He wouldn't he be would flying be, any more planes. Exactly. So it wasn't in his interest to find out, but he just yeah. said, you know, that, that there's a lot of people we believe he are there. his ears open and his mouth shut. Yeah. yeah, and then you got uh, what, what the FBI do with a witness protection program with new identities. The CIA come up with new identities for breakfast every day. You know, they just, jum, 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 how many do you need? There's all of these uh, now video effect programs uh, where you can create new, I mean, fantastic, perfect photos of individuals that never existed. That's and then right, just that's right, them. that's right. This new technique, yes, yes, yes. It's, it's, it's unreal. So what to believe nowadays? And uh, Yes, yes, yes. It's a, it's a confusing time when you can't trust well, your eyes. You know, what, I'm, what I'm saying, so what I'm dealing with is... Go ahead, Catherine. Sorry, I think my end froze over. I didn't mean to interrupt. I think no, 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 no. You weren't interrupting. You know, ahead. one of the things I'm wondering because I'm dealing with real, a real. Uh, so I, I, I'm dealing with the real Holocaust and real Holocaust victims. And yes, we do want to know back 2.0. Also, because and that's not because I'm particularly bloodthirsty, but I am a systems analyst. And the problem is that these psychopaths, they are networked, and if you just, you know, take them apart and lock them up for four years. They're going to regroup and they're going to perpetrate the very same genocides and go back to the very same networks. So if we really want to change the world, we have to wake up to the fact that we need to break up these networks once and for all, you know, because they have been running their, their, these family bloodlines, these mafia families and entire networks of people we don't even know about who are, I'm really saying, we do have a parallel society here, you know, 
and they are all networked. I believe they are all very strictly organized into Intel agencies and Intel agency like organizations and the Masons, which are actually pretty much the same thing. And we have one part of society that kind of, you know, goes to university, then gets a job and raises a family and then kind of like, you know, stays flat and stays in their community. And we've got a parallel society where people migrate up to levels and take control of more and more people under them, you know, and that's the second part of society. Now, I already have um, circumstantial evidence for this happening. For example, in the Stasi days, every sixth person was organized in Stasi and was an informant. Every sixth person. So if you think of your local community and you just count one, two, three, four, five, six in your neighborhood, the sixth person would be a, you know, a slave. Yeah. Now, one of the things I urge people to consider is just how little money the Stasi had compared to what we have these days when the banks are freely printing whatever. So the yeah. question is, how big is, for example, Vatican Intel these days? Would they have one in six people? Would they have maybe slightly more? One in five, perhaps? You know? Um, and that's what I mean by parallel society. These people have their own income streams. You know, they have their own uh, hierarchy. Well, East and Germany they even was have a, a much more contained much smaller population. I think in the United States, it's done differently. I mean, I, they, they have so infiltrated the media. Every newspaper, every TV station and so forth is has a CIA representative who's managing the news. I mean, this includes editorial page editors and the like. Uh, I think their dominance of the media is so complete, they don't need as many human resources as were necessary in East Germany at the time, Pat. Mm -hmm. So, but it's 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 also done with technology now nowadays. And the thing is, what pe what is important to understand is also you just need to control key people in key positions. Like I I remember I I made music for TV4 in Sweden. It's a national one of the biggest channels there. So I and uh, sometimes I I was with a friend who was uh, in the graphic uh, office doing graphics for the news. So it was really interesting for me because I was trying to learn as much as possible just because I'm interested. And I overheard uh, sometimes when they were like, they had these really early meetings when they were deciding what is the news for the day, what are, what are we going to go for, what is the big story, what, and so on. And uh, there were a few times when I was in the neighborhood type of thing when there were some bigger things coming in. And there were, according to my friend, there were instead of the normal stuff, there was like this person well-dressed who was just there and uh, not saying anything, but more or less like, or- Commanding, directing, man. Exactly, do you know like, no, not that one, do you know, but very discreet so that most people didn't under, but my friend, just because he you know I'm interested in this, not that he believes in what I'm doing, but he mentioned that, it was very strange because there was when this person appeared, it was not the same person every time, but it was just like there was like a slight little discreet guiding go that way. The that controller. Way. The controller. And it's in Sweden it's called the, the psychological defense of the nation. And they were they were they are part of the investigation of the uh, alleged assassination of Olaf Palme, the Swedish Prime Minister, and the the sinking of MS Estonia where almost a thousand people were killed. Uh, a ferry boat that was blown up to pieces. They were part of the investigation as well. So key people, and their task is to direct the attention of the nation in whatever direction is best for national security. I ask you, national security, what does that mean? What does these that are, even mean? These are PSYOP experts. There you go. And it's like, it's not the security of the nation, it's the so the security of these bad boys who are doing it. Or the deep it. state, security of the That's deep state, not exactly. the nation as it's ordinarily understood. Yeah. Catherine. Well, you know, it actually, in terms, one of the things I was studying is um, because when you are controlling, um, you know, that big an empire like the globalists are, you need to have your own communication channels. It's like co controlling a big corporation because actually that's what it is. It's a massive corporation, you know, according to canon law, you know, a huge ancient corporation that we're dealing with, in my view, you have to have some sort of communication. And this is what they developed the secret language for. So most, uh, you know, I always say most uh, gangsters have their gangster talk, you know, secrets, codes and signs that they can uh, communicate with. 
Now, that's exactly the same in this crime cartel, in this globalist cartel. And there are already whistleblowers who say that they have a dictionary of 3,000 to 4,000 words that have second meanings. So animals have symbology, you know, signs have symbology. We all know the, uh, you know, the all-seeing eye, the obelisk, the pentagram, but there are many, many more. And when they are speaking, it, this is the ultimate double speak. Now, when they are saying national, I believe they are referring to the nation made up of Freemasons, okay, of these Masonic families, this parallel society, which is, goes back to Vatican Intel, you know, the secret parallel society that lives alongside of us, but they have their own institutions, their own law, even their own hierarchies, and their society looks nothing like ours. But it's the organization is actually universal. It's the same in every country. You know, pretty so much. it's it's Masonic security instead yes, of national. Yes, it is. That's so super way, interesting. It, that so that way, is super interesting. The way I I was trying to so when I first started to investigate this, I'm I'm always trying to get my head around the system, and um, if you look, if you just think in terms of systems, uh, what you can say right now is that we have this sort of big globalist network, right? So a lot of people seem to be coordinated. Now, when you have a network of that size, it's pretty clear that it's very, very old. It needed to have, you know, a lot of time to grow to the size. Now, what you can also say is these people seem to be running everything pretty much across the world. Okay, so how did they get to this dominant position globally? Uh, and, and how dominant they are globally also indicates how old their systems are. They had to be at it for a very, very long time. So I thought, okay, whoever has dominance now has the monopoly, if you like. They needed to have the monopoly already 200 and 300 years ago because they are just so dominant now. So which candidates would have enough dominance, enough global reach 200 and 300 years ago? Well, it's the church, right? The church. It was everywhere. The, ch the church. The Catholic Church, of course. In any one royal family or ro royal domain, because the Vatican. Exactly, the Catholic Church, because it was also the Catholic Church. Remember, you know, the Portuguese and the Spanish who were uh, conquering uh, Latin America and so on. But they also the Catholic taking, Church. Now, what the Catholic Church had they, was a lot they of grounds. They had church ground. Go ahead. They were also taking confessions, yeah. so they knew everyone's yeah. secrets. Oh, that's a good one. That's a good exactly. one. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And it's actually a crucial one. It's a crucial one, actually. And the other thing is that the church gets 9% of your pre tax earnings. 9%. It, it, it's already deducted at the tax level if you're in the church. So they get a lot of money. But now the thing is, if you are running that big an empire, you need to have your own agency. So this is where the Jesuits come in. So you can tell that in every community where there was a church, they were also informants. So Vatican Intel, most people never thought about it like that. They think the CIA is the biggest, but it's actually Vatican Intel that's the biggest. And it has been global already way before the CIA even existed. That's really so, interesting now, because I've, I've, I've had others who have suggested the same thing, but it's been difficult for me to appraise. I think you're giving it context in an historical framework that makes a lot of sense. Continue. And now, now comes the key, and this is where we, I, will, I will try to close the circle, because as I was investigating this, I also discovered that uh, the, the entire Vatican architecture okay, is, is actually, it has the structure of one big corporation. And this corporation is constituted according to canon law. If you go to Switzerland, some older Swiss families will tell you that the cantons and the land ownership of very old families is con constituted according to canon law, right? Now, Switzerland it belongs to the Knights Templar, as a uh, South African historian, Sean Frost, has explained to us. So Switzerland was founded exactly the time period after the, um, the Knights Templar were in Jerusalem, that it takes most people on horseback to go from Jerusalem to Switzerland. Okay, so anyway, we have these big structures in our society that are still constituted according to canon law. So, you know, tr uh, closing the circle, if Vatican Intel was global, you know, as soon as they started exploring uh, Latin America and America, right? 
Vatican Intel would have sent spies on the ship. Vatican Intel was there. It was everywhere else in Europe and so on. When we're talking about MI6 these days and the CIA, what they actually are, they are branch officers of Vatican Intel. That's all. So in other words, MI6 is the British branch office. Germany, BND is the German branch office. And, you know, CIA is therefore the uh, American branch office. Now, the thing is, the question is, what is the corporation according to which, you know, this whole architecture of people was constituted? So, so Cap, Catherine, it just, to to, the, you know, just to interject, many of us would suggest it's the Israelis, the Mossad that has been infiltrating the CIA, for example. So we need to figure the relationship between the, the, the Jewish branch. I can tell you the relationship. The fran Jewish franchise. Wait, wait. Go ahead. Wait, I, 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 will, I, will, I will answer your question if you allow me to cl close the deductive chain. I will endeavor to answer this. So let's go back in time because it's sometimes easier to understand. Okay, so I hope most of your viewers can follow me. If you send ships to explore Latin, um, Latin America, going back to the 15th century, you would send your spies if you are the Vatican, right? You wouldn't just let some local king, you know, go out and get his, you know, his hands on something. So they sent the spies there. Spies were in Latin America and everywhere in America already centuries ago before the CIA existed. By the time the CIA was founded, right, they already had an intel network. Now, you know, the oldest countries closest to the Vatican will have the oldest intel networks. Now, Israel is very, very young. It's a very young country. And it's, I would say, it's the personal fiefdom of Baron Rothschild because Baron Rothschild was sent the congratulation letter, you know, by um, the, you know, the queen to say, hey, congratulations, here it is. There's your country, right? So Mossad is very young. It's a puppy compared to MI6 and the CIA even, you know, and it's, it's like ridiculously young compared to Vatican. So what is Mossad? Mossad is the newest branch office. But if you have a bank with branch offices, your personnel sometimes migrates, right? They change from the London office to maybe the Paris office and so on. So, and if you look at and you talk to Intel whistleblowers or Intel agents, you discover that they have worked for a very large number of these agencies. For example, Carl Clark in, in the UK, he worked for Mossad, he worked for MI6, for other countries. How come? It's because these, all these intel agencies are the very same corporation. He just changed branch offices. Will you have senior Mossad in the CIA? Hell yes. Will you have CIA and MI6 and Mossad? Yes, of course. It's all a mix. And I can also tell you that KGB and MI6 are also just different branch offices mm -hmm. of the same corporation. There was never any difference what the hell soever it's all just a hoax the entire cold war was just a flick you know freaking hoax so Catherine, um now Catherine, this is absolutely dazzling i want to know if Oli has any reason to take exception or whether he would be willing to at least tentatively explore that hypothesis possibly even support it at least in part no. No, what you're saying is nothing new to me. They, I, I, this is spot on as far as I know. Uh, Chip also talks a lot about how they, they, they're they working together all the time, you know, depending on what nation they're targeting. Then they use key people in, in the targeted nation, but they use people from abroad. So if it's uh, France they're doing something in, they would use anyone except the French because they would be more easily identified. And so they would use the Danes and the Turks and the whatever in that country, or if you needed to do a hit somewhere else. You, so, and uh, very often, I mean, some of his colleagues, uh, like one of the people he actually blew up in a plane, he was working for Mossad, uh, Pat Weber, I think his uh, uh, alias was, his, uh, Ani, uh, I forgot his real name. But uh, uh, when you look at, it's very important to understand that just because people are in these organizations doesn't mean that they understand what they're in. It's so compartmentalized. It's so by design. It's super important that no one gets the whole picture. So it's in a pyramid shape, pyramids within pyramids, all compartmentalized, chopped up in little pieces so that no one under get it. And it's the same with these intelligence agencies. Like in, on a street level, they're different 
and entities, but the higher up you come in the power pyramid, they're all connected. As far as I know, KDB, CIA, Mossad, BOSS, uh, the West German, uh, MI6, MI5, the Swedish, uh, the Danish PET, as far as I know, you go up to the top, they're connected. You go down on the street level, they're totally separate. But it's once again, it's, a, it's an illusion. It's the wizard of us pulling the strings behind us, thinking that, oh, like you were talking about the Cold War. Once you start looking into the Cold War, you will find out it was a big psyop. It was a big psyop that what we were being told was just not true. It was fear porn uh, pumped up to get this conflict going so that they could play their game and do whatever they wanted to us. As our conversation reaches its conclusion, I must say that I regard the two of you as among the most intelligent, perceptive, and thoughtful analysts of the contemporary state of affairs in the world today. And it's just to me virtually breathtaking to listen to your discourse. I can't tell you when I've had a more satisfying informative and illuminating conversation with any guests on any program I've ever done. Catherine, yes. I'm so grateful to you and you're fighting the good fight. Only I admire you beyond words. You're both among my heroes and I'm just so grateful to have you here today. One final word from each of you before we part. Oh, first of all, thank you. Thank you, Jim. For, you know, from, from an experienced academic, that is really a compliment and I'm very, very honored. Thank you. I just would like to finish with the final sentence that my, um, my investigation uh, has now, well, this is now my final conclusion and I'm, I'm inviting people to try to disprove me or back me up, whichever way. But I came to the conclusion that the big corporation uh, according to canon law that incorporates all these intel agencies and pretty much, you know, most of the world. Uh, it's, it is these people who are in the corporation, governed by the corporation, working for the corporation, sometimes without their knowledge, that form this parallel society. And it is this corporation preying on the ones who are not in it. So now the key question is, what's the name of the corporation? And I would like to leave that as a final puzzle so that people, before I give the answer, people do their own investigation because it has a name. And they actually put their name everywhere as a brand. And now it's, that's the, you know, my puzzle to your, to your audience. Fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. For those who want to see the video version of this program, it'll be up at 153news.net. My special thanks to Dr. Catherine Horton and to Ole Domegaard for being here and to all of you for listening. And may I add something, Jim? Because we've been, we've been talking about things that are quite terrifying, I'm sure, for a lot of people. So I would very much like, uh, normally I, I don't uh, add prayers, but I would very much like to, to end with a prayer. I'm not a religious person whatsoever. I am a spiritual being and I'm, being, I'm walking the way of truth, the way I see it. So uh, the one, the prayer that I always end with uh, is this one that I really love. It goes like this. May the entire universe be filled with peace and joy, love and light. May everyone, and especially the ones who heard us, be filled with peace and joy, love and light. May the light of truth overcome all darkness, so victory to that light. So be it, so be it, devoutly to be wished. I can't thank you enough. And thank you all for listening.